In the name of the one who creates, redeems, and sustains. Amen. We all want to be healed. We all want to be saved. But what do we want to be healed from and what do we want to be saved for? The ministry of healing plays a critical role in our pastoral relationships to each other as well as to our outreach efforts. How do we hold ourselves and others? How do we do that when what happens in life comes at you? How do you respond to the challenges, the expectations, the tensions, the pressures placed on you personally by those close to you, be they family or close friends, and professionally, the work pressures? So the question is to use a more urban expression, or as they say in the streets, how do you roll? How do you fight back the edge? What inner resources do you have to get by? Take a look at the last 10 months of your own lives. As you muse on these questions, take a quick look at your life and the life of your families for the last 10 months. As we take a look at this morning's gospel story, let me say quietly that help is on the way. Help to get through this without cynicism or a sense of defeatism. But first, an introduction. I want to restate the values that I believe are inherent in this morning's story. And I found this in a piece by Yunuma Okora, who is an author of a book called Reluctant Pilgrims. And he says this, God's saving power is for all people across time and space. God wills us to believe in divine power to call upon it and to respond in faith when we perceive it at work around or within us. We get so lost in our own limited realities that we forget the reality of what is possible with God. We put human power above God, forgetting that God called all that God called all creation into being. Power begins and ends with God. And God cares about the details of God's creation, from the awe-inspiring placing of the stars in the universe to domestic care for ailing mothers-in-law. Continually, God uses God's power to draw us to fullness. What a wonderful way and back context drop to help us understand what all of us have gone through in the last 10 months. But as we said over and over to ourselves in the various forums this past last 10 months, it's about the reality of change. Change is constant in this old world. What we experience is change coming at us with an ever greater velocity. The result is for all of us, young, middle-aged or elderly, we're all tired. Often it feels like we are no longer living the lives we have, but rather barely dealing with the life as it comes to us. The news is often little help. The pandemic is producing its own malaise. The stock market is up and down, the spread of wars and international conflict, or the rumors of wars. The decisions regarding which nations that will be first to receive the vaccine is just in my mind, anger producing. Just ask anyone, how you doing? And then listen for the word overwhelmed. It's like we are not so much living our lives as it is, but that life is coming at us too fast to handle. And so we look today at Mark's gospel. It is, quote, a day in the life, end of quote, kind of story. And Jesus is the central figure. Within just a few verses, he bounces from need to need and place to place. His daily journal, if he kept one, could be not more jam-packed 
even if he were a politician giving a stump speech at every whistle stop. First, we see that there had been a high profile synagogue encounter, remember last Sunday, fast followed by a personal encounter with his apostle Peter's mother-in-law sick at her bedside and Jesus restoring her to her community and vocation. And it is not only Peter's mother-in-law, it's all kinds of people coming and coming as Jesus heals and cares and restores countless people, setting them free from illness and possession to be the persons they are meant to be. He set so many people free. Mark says that it, take, it took a toll on him and it forces Jesus to retreat for a time of silence and prayer. Shortly, however, the disciples notice that he has disappeared and they hunt him down, as the Greek says, literally hunt him down, telling him that he has more cures to perform. You think he was running the ER at one of the local hospitals. However, during that time of silence and prayer, Jesus is restored or perhaps senses the profound need around him and he goes once more to embrace the mission entrusted to him, to heal and feed and care for and set free all who recognize their need and come to him. It's a hectic itinerary, isn't it? This bunch of, these three stories all bunched together, one public, one personal and one private, each invites us to eavesdrop on Jesus's spirituality how he lived and the faith he practiced among the demands of an overwhelming world. Maybe this story that Mark describes is the story of his community attempt to meet the needs and deal with the various challenges of ministry while at the same time attend to their own spirituality, which is what drew them to Jesus in the first place. This story pushes us beyond the choice between action-oriented faith versus contemplative faith and offers that there is another dimension to Jesus's teaching and healing. Jesus frees us not only from things that seek to oppress us, but also for a life of purpose, meaning and good works. So we come to Jesus for healing, but that healing is to help us discover a life of purpose, a life of meaning and good works. I suspect that what Jesus was up to as he was sequestered in a deserted place to pray, perhaps by tending to his prayer life, he found perspective from the prey, almost like the wings of an eagle looking over the woes and foes of life. If Jesus's proclamation is about giving us the tools to develop a life of purpose and meaning, I wonder, as one of the commentators and persons I was looking at as I was preparing this sermon regarding this story, and he says, and he poses this query as a response to Jesus freeing us for, what did the man for whom the unclean spirit was cast out a week ago do after his healing? What did all the people Jesus heals in this week's story do once they are freed from the various elements of mind, body, and spirit that had captivated them? Some were simply so grateful to be made well, so grateful that is, that they had been freed from something debilitating or destructive, that they returned as quickly as possible to their old lives and routines and relationships. But some, including Simon's mother-in-law, recognized that they weren't only freed from something, they're also free for, freed for something for lives of purpose and meaning and service and generosity and much more. Today's story ends, this is part three, with Jesus not following the advice of his disciples. Remember, they tracked him down saying, everyone is looking for you. And what was Jesus' response? Let's head in the other direction to nearby villages 
so that I can preach there too. That's why I've come. It appears that Jesus had a kind of clarity that comes out of one's deepest identity, which finds its source and sustenance in God. So when life comes at you this week, will you be ready? You've paused, hopefully. You've pondered, and hopefully you've prayed. You've had to make tough choices, but you have a tough faith. Even before the week begins, you have found a good place to remember that your life is grounded in the goodness of God. So I want us to remember, as Enuma Okora reminds us in the second part of his piece, and he says this, we endure and continue in faith only because of God's sustaining spirit, yet we still have responsibilities. That's what Jesus did. After he prayed, after he acquired more clarity, he went on to continue to the next village's mission, which was to preach. What do we do with the invitations to belief, discipline, commitment, perseverance, witness, and proclamation? How do we remain open to God's transforming power, allowing our lives to be a light that breaks through the darkness of fear, hunger, sickness, poverty, oppression, enslavement, and captivity? We are reminded who God is, of what God is capable, and how we are called to follow. So as we look at our lives for the last 10 months, as we hopefully move beyond being overwhelmed, and as we come together to pray, to discern, and let God stand with you in the midst of all this overwhelmness, we begin to discover not only what we are freed from, but what we are freed for. And as Frederick Buchner says, and this is where God is, as God stands next to us, the place God calls us to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meets. And so we pray. Loving and liberating God, we give thanks that whatever terrain awaits us, you will meet us there and that will be enough. In the name of the one who came to dwell among us, amen.